Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with episode 31 of the podcast. And today I'm talking with Luis Sanchez. He is a Costa Rican quilter. He's also an emergency room doctor. And we talk about what brought him into quilting and then how he started a new YouTube channel sharing tutorials in Spanish. So I really enjoyed talking with Luis. And what was great is he is a follower of mine, joined the Facebook group, started connecting and chatting you know so this is very much an online quilting friend that I've made recently and it was so nice to get to know him a little bit better and hopefully in a few months we'll have a little collaboration and be able to quilt along together as well so I hope you're looking forward to this interview now as for what's going on around the house it is really busy. I've got just a lot of like little projects that are kind of all coming to a head right now. And the biggest one is Quilty Box. So October 2017 is my Quilty Box month. I got to pick the stuff that came in the box and we are making a heart medallion checkerboard quilt together. So this is just an example. I actually made up a second one. <laughs> I made up one for Quilty Box and then now I've made a second top that I'm going to be quilting because it will fit my kitchen table just a little bit better. I'm using this quilt as a tablecloth. Uh, so basically it's heart medallions. They're green and blue heart medallion designs that I designed for Island Batik. So you get two yards of that fabric in the quilty box. And then I've created a series of five tutorials that will guide you through fussy cutting out the medallions and then piecing them together and then we quilt it. So we're stitching in the ditch and outline quilting, some straight line quilting, and then fill in the border with a beautiful heart paisley design. So you can find all of that. It's just this massive little mini quilt along and you can find all of it already put up uh, and it's at leahday.com slash checkerboard. So definitely go and check it out. I'm super proud of these tutorials. Uh, putting them together, I really wanted them to be like a, you know, just a perfect beginner baseline. You know, if you're just getting started and you don't know what stitching in the ditch means, or, you know, you, you've got some fabric and you're like, well, I wanna just stitch around it, but I don't know how, then, you know, watch the video on outline quilting and, you know, simple straight lines, you can't get better than that for a really simple border design. And then Heart Paisley to go with the heart medallions. So it was just a really fun tutorial, series of tutorials that I created. I had a lot of fun making it. So I really hope that you'll come and check it out, leahday.com slash checkerboard. So what am I working on today? This is, uh, I, I'm kind of set up here in the crafty cottage and I'm in my favorite corner in my favorite chair and it's actually cooled down enough that I have the heater on, which is, awesome. <laughs> I have been waiting for this moment all summer long because it has been so hot and I'm so tired of it. I'm just done with the hot weather. And so it's actually chilly enough in here that I've got uh, my bacon socks on and the heater going. So it's nice and cozy. And I made this minky patchwork scarf and I'll share a picture of it in the show notes so you can see it. So I'm, I'm feeling really, really cozy. And what I'm working on is auditioning designs for a series of mini quilts. I have just this whole stack of mini quilts. It kind of feels like, all my minis fail in my lap all at once. So some of these are just personal projects. So this is a, uh, a candy corn mini that's gonna be a hoop quilt from my wall. And this is just something, it's a tangent for myself. I hung up all my hoop quilt, um, all my hoops that I purchased on my wall. And I was like, I really wanna make something cute for the fall. And then they just sat there and were empty for several weeks. And then I was like, all right, Leah, if you're gonna do this, you really gotta do it. So this weekend, I finally got busy and made two little candy corn minis. And you can see these in the show notes. They're so super cute. And then I've got one other mini for hoop quilts. Here we go. And it's little fall leaves in a, in a green background. So it's like yellow leaves in a brown circle with a green back out, background. And that looks super cute. And, uh, and then I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm just looking at these and just figuring out how I wanna quilt them, you know, what I wanna stitch around it. And sometimes it can just be as simple as possible. Like I might just stitch these in the ditch and leave it at that. And then I also have some collaborations. These are mini collaborations. So this one is from Margaret Lewin. 
Uh, and so she was on the podcast a few weeks ago, well, I should say a few months ago, and she sent me this block to stitch. And then a little sneak peek, this one's from Krista Watson from her new book, and one from Orange Dot Quilts, Dora. She sent me that one months ago, and I really need to get it done. So I'm gonna sit here and just be kind of planning out these designs and figuring out when I wanna quilt over all of these quilts. And my method is really simple. Sometimes a quilt can just be a little tricky and I might not know what to stitch on it, but the key I find, find is uh, giving myself time to look at it and then also planning the design on paper. So I have printed out, what I did was just snapped a picture of all of these quilts and then I printed it out on paper and then now I'm just gonna sit here and draw and play on the surface. And the nice thing is, I can go print this out again if I mess it up <laughs> and that's not a big deal and that's okay actually that's what I want to do I want to make a total mess and then in the end I'll have figured out what I like and what I don't like and I'll have answered some questions so like right now it's kind of like oh I could stitch anything on any of these right but by drawing and playing on the surface, I can start looking at it going, well, no, I don't really feel like curves on that quilt, or that quilt feels like it needs jagged lines, or that quilt feels like it needs pebbling, or whatever, you know? I can start answering that question, getting a feel for the different quilts, and then also be looking at how much time I have to stitch them. Like a couple of these need to be stitched like today. So in order to do that, the quilting design needs to be fairly simple and not dense or complicated, which will take too much time to quilt on my home machine. So it's like taking all of that into account along with, you know, overall, I wanna make them pretty. I want the quilting design to be an asset and to really enhance and benefit that piecing design. So I'm just gonna sit here and do a little bit of sketching and just kind of talk about some other things that are going on and that I'm wanting to work on. And uh, one thing that I'm working on a lot is accountability. And it's, it's really, it's the idea that if I share something with you and say it out loud, well, then I have to do it because I don't have a choice. I've just, I've just shared that. And you know, it'll be like egg on my face if I don't get it done. So uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is NaNoWriMo. Now, Josh makes fun of me every time I say that word. <laughs> but basically it's, uh, it's the national month of writing is in November. And it used to not be a big deal, but a couple years ago, well, it was longer than that, I think about 10 years ago, uh, the organization NaNoWriMo kind of got, you know, a big, they made it a big deal to join in the fun of NaNoWriMo and to make it a challenge to write 50,000 words in a book in that month. And so now they have this website set up where you have goals and a tracker and you can uh, set up your book and, and keep it updated with your word count so that you know it's, it's everything is designed to encourage writers to write that much, 50,000 words, in the month of November. And then you know that's a good chunk of a book. So that would be the average novel, like a fiction novel, is between 70 and, uh, a and 100,000 words. So 50,000 words could be anywhere from two thirds to half of the book, all knocked out in one single month in 30 days. So um, I had heard about NaNoWriMo before, and of course, you know, like, you know, I, I've been listening to writing podcasts. My favorite one is uh, The Creative Pen with Joanna Penn. And uh, for some reason this year, I was just like, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do NaNoWriMo. And I've had some ideas for some fiction novels and I have been sitting down this month and working on the outline. So this is something that I think everybody does differently. And uh, for me, I know that my best quilts are the quilts that I design to within an inch of their life. Like there is no stone left unturned. There is no question in my mind about how I'm gonna quilt that. The best goddess quilt that I, I think I ever did was Shadow Self. She's actually hanging up in my uh, living room now. And 
with that quilt, I sat down and planned everything. I planned the piecing design, then I planned the quilting design. I planned every single little bit of it. I had the fillers picked, everything, so that when it actually came time to do all those steps, like to put the quilt together and then to get it basted and then start quilting, there was never a question of how it went. It was so quick and easy to move from step to step to step because there was no question. There was nothing left unfinished or kind of worrisome, you know, worrisomely left undone. And contrast this with other goddess quilts that I've done where it's just been like, I didn't know what I was doing and it took so much more time. And then usually in the end, I wasn't very happy with the results. Well, I find that I write very much the same way. I need to plan it out. I need to know what I'm writing, where I'm writing it. And the really good thing is working on the outline I was able to figure, you know, find holes in my plot, you know, like, how does this work? Is there magic? Is, you know, it's kind of an adventure fantasy novel. And, uh, and you know, had to ask the question, you know, like, how does this all work? And, you know, does it work for everybody the same way? And then if it doesn't work, you know, it's like, there's like a magic system in a world. It's, you've got to have it grounded in some form of reality. I mean, it's magic, but still, you've got to make it make sense so that if one person can do something magical, you know, it, she can't be the only one that does something magical. Everybody else has got to have that ability too, or she's got to be somehow special in her own way. So it's like kind of digging deep into those questions. And it was funny, I, I kind of did exactly what I do with quilts. I went way complicated and then had to go, no, none of that is working. <laughs> and then pull back and come at it in a different way. But it's only by going, you know, way complicated and intense was I able to pull back and go, oh, this fixes it. This is so much simpler. This makes so much more sense, you know. And then two, you know, writing 30 scenes of a novel and planning that out and figuring out the climaxes and the lulls and the dips and all that kind of stuff was really fascinating. I enjoyed that experience. Um, I have read a book on writing that I really recommend and that is uh, 2K to 10K. And it is about writing volume of words, you know. And there's a lot of people out there that are like, oh, well, if you write, you know, 10,000 words in a day, it's gonna be all terrible writing. And, you know, there's certainly a lot of quilters out there that are like, wow, if you quilted that in a day, it's going to be a terrible quilt. You know, it's the same kind of mentality that length of time makes it better. And to be frank, I just simply don't believe in that. And, and also, I don't have a million years to, to work on this. I have one month and I really want to get it done. Uh, and really what that book wrote, broke down was it broke down your scenes and your plot and getting it to work really fluidly in a way that makes a lot of sense. And then also to make each scene exciting. So that way, like, if I don't want to write that scene and it's boring and dragging, then you're probably not going to want to read it. <laughs> so, you know, it was one of those things, realizing that like, wow, okay, every single scene needs to be exciting and I need to be excited to write it. And that changed things a lot where, you know, I might have had a scene or two and I was kind of going, well, that kind of works. And I guess we'll have, you know, a lot of dialogue there. And instead of looking at it, okay, well, what's the conflict? And what's the goal of the main character? And does she move and go somewhere and get somewhere in that scene? And if she doesn't, then that's not a new scene. So anyway, I know this is kind of me gabbing on and on and about writing and probably not all that interested in it, but I am so excited. I have 30 scenes. It is planned out to a T. It's an awesome book and I'm thrilled to be working on it. So each morning I'm getting up doing my yoga routine and then setting down and knocking out one of those scenes. And I probably only have 30 minutes to an hour in that time, but I was able to write 1500 words this morning. And then in the afternoon around 3.30, 4 o'clock when Josh goes to get James, I have another 30 minutes to an hour or so that I can knock out a little bit more writing. So like in that in-between time, I'm kind of thinking about what's going on and the tone I want to set and what I want to have happen next uh, within that scene that I'm working on. So this is all super exciting and I'm thrilled to be writing. It's very, very different from writing nonfiction, from writing about quilting. And so I think that may be something that I need to maybe go with a nonfiction book, then a fiction book, then a nonfiction book, you know, like write a book about quilting, then write a book about 
a fantasy novel about quilting, you know, and just kind of play with that and see where that leads. So I'm just really excited about all of these fun projects moving forward. And I have one other cool kind of slightly secret thing that I wanted to share with you. And that is my quilting frame. So I have been quilting on the Grace Cunique uh, as a set down long arm since January. And I've been really curious about quilting it on a frame, about moving the machine over the quilt instead of moving the quilt under the needle. And I know I'm gonna hear a little bit of pushback from people. I know that I'm gonna hear a few people like, oh my gosh, you're committing treason. I've heard that before, it's okay. Uh, you have to follow your own curiosity. And I'm curious about quilting on a frame. I will never stop quilting on a home sewing machine. I have lots of home sewing machines. It's a home sewing machine out here in the crafty cottage with me. I will never stop sharing those videos and I have shared over a thousand. So there's a lot to watch and enjoy but I have to follow my curiosity and see where that leads me as well. And that has led me to wanting to quilt on a quilting frame where I move the machine, not the quilt. And so I have a few more videos to shoot as a uh, sit down long arm uh, upstairs in the, in the guest bedroom. And then I'll move the machine downstairs onto the frame once we get it set up and see how that goes. And what's cool is I was able to get a new insert cut for the quilty so that one of my home sewing machines can go on that table. So it's like, there's gonna be this whole big shakeup and everything's gonna be moving around quite a lot in the next couple of weeks. But I'm really excited about that and I can't wait to start sharing videos on it. I'm not so sure when those videos will be coming out. Uh, probably it's gonna take a few more weeks to kind of get that transition going. And then of course, it'll take me a little while just to get the machine set up properly and get used to that. But I am definitely going to be sharing ugly stitches because I know it will not be pretty starting out. And I want you to see that. So I'll be sharing all my ugly stitches with you as I, you know, probably disastrously quilt <laughs> on this quilting frame. I have a lot of quilt tops that have been set aside specifically for this, just for my ugly stitches so I can knock them out quilt, you know, quickly. I might donate them to charity. I might keep them just as like, hey, this is my first frame quilty quilt and that's okay. So I hope that you enjoy seeing this little kind of snippet of what I'm working on and hear what's going on around the house. I love what I do. And uh, I really more than anything else feel so fortunate to be living this creative, wonderful life. But I want you to know it's a lot of work and a lot of effort goes into it. And you know, right now, Josh is slugging it out trying to fix my printer that I just broke yesterday. And dad is stitching in the ditch on the quilt that we will be quilting along with next year. So there is a lot going on always and we sincerely appreciate your support. So if you're at all interested in supporting this podcast, definitely go and check out our website, leahday.com where you can find books and tools. Uh, we have some beautiful fabrics and online quilting workshops you can take with me and learn new things about quilting. A lot of our workshops guide you step by step through a project. So if you're not sure one of those steps in the quilting process, you can take a workshop with me and really answer a lot of those questions. So I hope you'll come and check out the website at leahday.com. And now here's a little introduction with Luis. Hello quilting friends, I am Luis from Los Meninos de Sanchez in San Jose, Costa Rica. I am a hobbyist quilter and I've been quilting since two years ago by now. This is my house and I'm honored to be here with you in Leah's podcast today. This is my sewing room, I'm going to show it a little bit to you. Those are my threads, my pre-cuts and so far this is a nice shot because as all of you, I have a mess around. A very huge mist. I think everyone has that kind of closet with all the fabrics there. But anyway, this is what gives me peace, what gives me tranquility. And whenever I can, I'm here sewing, I'm here making videos. I have a YouTube channel, which you are invited to visit anytime. You can find it by searching Los Meninos de Sanchez. Right now, I'm filming a video on joining Quilt As You Go blocks with some of Leah's designs. And I hope to see you around. So let's go with the podcast. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with Luis Sanchez. Welcome to the show, Luis. Hi, Leah. I'm so excited to be here. 
Hello to all the quilting friends, too. Yes, hello, my quilting friends. So a little introduction. Dr. Luis Sanchez spends most of his time in the emergency department of St. John's of God Hospital, located in San Jose, Costa Rica, all the way down in Central America. So this is our first international conversation. This is so exciting. Uh, he is a fan of our channel, and I often see Luis's kind comments on YouTube. So he's a passionate hobby quilter, but he's also started teaching on a channel of his own on YouTube and sharing his work on Facebook. So this is just so cool. You're a doctor, you're a quilter. Tell me how you got into this and what made you want to start your first quilt? Well, it was crazy because at first I was just into sewing because my grandmother was a sewer for all her life. She was a single mother. She had three children, which back 50 years ago, it was like huge. For a single mother to raise their children so uh, she sewed and she sewed a lot she had even three jobs she sewed in a factory then in another factory and in her house and she raised all these three children by sewing with her sewing machine and so all my life i grew up wearing her pajamas the ones that she made me my kindergarten uniforms my school uniforms even my college and university first uh, scrubs for the medicine school, she did them to me. So I always had that remember of her um, sewing and that sound of her sewing machine gave me calm. Then she passed away about seven years ago and it was a hard time for all of the family because she was like uh, the main person in my father's family and we all felt a lot her absence. My aunt even left her sewing room untouched for like five years. So about three years ago she was just uh, taking out all of her stuff and she said okay we'll give her clothes to charity and I want to get rid of her sewing machine. I said no way you can't get rid of her sewing machine. I will keep it. I don't know what I'm gonna do but I will keep it. And so I bring it to my house and I put it in the room. I didn't know what to do at first, so um, I didn't have time to go to lessons or anything. So I started by watching some YouTube channels. First of all, I started uh, with sewing channels, like learning to make hem sewing machines and my clothes and fixing stuff, like, you know, basic, basic stuff. And then I came across to some uh, crafters like Vanessa from Crafty Gemini and I started making little projects uh, like wallets and uh, little coin purses and I liked it and then I started to see that sometimes they mixed fabrics and I said okay what are they doing they're using scraps okay I think my granddaughter had some scraps over there then I took them I started sewing scraps together I didn't know what I was doing I didn't know I was doing patchwork by that time then I saw that they were joining scraps with batting and reversing and doing some motion. I think I saw one of your videos and I say, okay, what is she doing? That's crazy. That's amazing. What can you do with that? And I said, that's a way to improve your fabric so I can make better wallets and bags and things like that. I liked it. And I think that I started uh, with thread painting. That was one of the first things I approached to free motion quilting. And it was like a little cat I wanted to embroider. And that also became my logo because I wanted to put it on a, an apron. I did to my aunt because she liked them a lot. And I, I, I just started and I didn't know what I was doing. The thread was a mess at first. And so I kept and kept and kept practicing until I became a little better. And then I started on quilting. And I also watched a lot of your videos, a lot of tips you gave, and then I became like more mixing all those stuff and like having my own my own way to that by making some quilts, making some crafts, making purses, making bags, and then I said, well, I'm so grateful with all these great people that teach us through YouTube, through Facebook and all those channels, and I was like so amazed that that could be possible nowadays. People from far away teaching me how to do this kind of stuff. 
That is so wonderful. I'm just, I'm blown away by your story. And I love that you still have your grandmother's sewing machine. That is so special. Um, I still have my grandmother's sewing machine. It's actually at my dad's house and it's a, it's a cam machine. So you kind of like slot in different cams. So what is the machine that you got from your grandmother? It's an old senior machine. Cool. Yeah, it was just a basic machine with even you have to push um, on your feet to move it. Then later she put an um, a electric engine. And I like it a lot because that was my first machine. That's how I felt that connection with her. Listening to that machine again gave me that, that feeling when I went to her lap and I was like afraid and she was just sewing and hearing that sound comforted me. So it made the connection again. I felt like she was there with me, teaching me to sew and teaching me to do stuff with her machine. And later that feeling became not with the machine, but with the sewing and creating and sewing. Now I have four machines. <laughs> so you want to list off the machines that you've got now? Well, yes, now I use a better machine. I use a, a Singer XL580 which is also an embroidery machine. I like it a lot. And, but the feeling is still there. And her machine is still in my room and it will be there forever, I think. Or I have a little niece, maybe she will learn to quilt and I give it to her. Absolutely, that's so wonderful. Okay, so you're also a medical doctor. So you are learning how to quilt online through YouTube videos and Facebook. And you're also, you've got this whole other life, you know, being a doctor in an emergency room. So how do you balance all of that and then also start a YouTube channel and start selling, you know, sharing stuff online? Well, it was at first that I, I made all this stuff only for hobby and I say, okay, now what I do with all these things? And I started giving them away to my colleagues and some nurses and they say, oh, this is pretty, you should sell this, uh, you should share this thing, I love it. Or they also started making me uh, requests. Can you make this? I saw this on, inter on Instagram. I saw this on Pinterest. Can you make some sort of... And I said, okay, I'll try it. And that's what I love. The challenge of making new things. And yes, being in a hospital all day is tired. And listening to people talking and usually complaining about their emergency is hard. That, that's a part that people don't see. That we also have feelings. Sometimes people say emergency doctors don't have feelings. Well, we do, <laughs> but we have to remain calm a bit between all this craziness. So when I get home, I just want to be quiet. I just want to be myself. I just want to relax. And sewing gives me that. So whenever I have time, even five minutes a day, I just go into my happy space, which is my sewing room, and I start sewing and I start quilting something. And I am a little messy because uh, I can't stay quiet for too much time. I usually have three or four projects at the same time and I just pick one, try to finish it and then go to the next one. Then I said after I had my Facebook page growing and people liking it and some people said that why don't you share what you learned? I said okay that would be a great idea but what can I do? I don't know nothing about YouTube videos, I don't know nothing about editing, recording or anything. So I started like with a small uh, video about making some stars that I saw uh, because there weren't too much uh, YouTube videos in Spanish about that kind of things. There are lots of English and videos, but you know, in Latin America and it's not like quilting is very popular. So uh, it's a new thing and even there's people doing it for a long, long time. Uh, is a new thing so people don't know a lot people don't know what the work it requires and so it, it's it's nice to have English channels uh, from the US and from the rest of the world uh, that teach us how to do and how to get um, to become better in what we are doing mm -hmm. so I said okay what I'm learning here with these channels I want to share it to and I want to share it as I did for free for just the love of quilting the love of sewing and I started a small channel, which is Menino de Sanchez, that anyone can visit. And then I have over 26 videos by now about sewing, crafting, and some of quilting. And actually, I'm working one right now uh, about joining Quilt As You Go blocks. 
um, which I practice with some of your, of your blogs, uh, some of your stitches. Excellent. And congratulations on your new book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, so you are taking kind of what you've learned and you putting your own spin on it and, and changing it up. But then you're also sharing that information in Spanish. Have you done any tutorials in English as well? Or is this entirely in Spanish? No, I think there are pretty much tutorials in English. Um, the difference is that in Spanish, we have lots of accents and sometimes people use words that uh, one country or another don't understand. So I try to make it like the most neutral possible and say that, okay, let's do it for everyone. Right now I've been amazed because I even have followers in Spain, in Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, Nicaragua, Mexico, and here in Costa Rica, of course. And I said, okay, this is getting nice. This is getting pretty. And people post very kind comments and they thank a lot and usually their love is what keeps you doing this. Absolutely. The kindness is really where it's at. I love that. And uh, so are there any local quilting groups in your area? You said it's not very popular in Costa Rica, but have you formed any quilting groups or do you get together with any quilters there locally? Well, I don't have pretty much time to go around, uh, but there are quilting groups. For example, I have a long armor. Uh, quilter, Lily. Uh, she's a very nice lady and I've learned a lot from her and sometimes I practice low mark quilting in her machine and my quilts that I take to her, she lets me quilt them. And so she has a small group with her church. They have a, um, a, a, a school and they teach lots of things, cooking, sewing, quilting for ladies so they can learn. There are quilters everywhere. But the country is small. It's about the size of West Virginia or so. And going to get things for like rulers and stuff only in the capital. It's hard for the people in the provinces like in the coasts or far away from the capital to get that stuff. So I said also to put um, a little of myself in my videos explain how to do it with all those fancy stuff and sometimes uh, for people to make their own patterns and to try to measure by themselves sometimes using scissors because not everyone has access to all the facilities you have there even getting good thread is hard here i usually get mine from amazon and i am a compulsive buyer <laughs> i also have fabrics everywhere here so that's where i get because even fabrics are hard to get here. Uh, we have cotton fabrics, but not high quality quilting uh, cotton fabrics. So usually the most we have here are like Bernatex and, and that's all. And so you have to keep what that stores have. And it's, it's, it's hard because you can't find a collection. You can't find free cuts. You can't find um, fabrics that match all together to make this kind of scrappy quilts that you're used to make there with uh, some of the... Of the Recut design. Sure. It sounds like that is such a wonderful thing to focus on because that, and I think that's something that we can sometimes lose track of is that from its core, quilting was a scrappy hobby using what you've got, the scissors you got in the, the kitchen drawer, you know, and cutting things out with, you know, like back in the day, I can remember I had a book on creating a template from the back of a cereal box, you know, like with that cardboard. You know, and, and I think that we definitely need to look back at that instead of like the new template, the new die cutter, the new rotary cutter, the new all the stuff, you know, looking back at the way quilting was before it was so simple. And I love that you're doing that because I think more than anything else, we need to be telling people that they can make quilts and not have the whole kitchen sink, you know, that you can do this with just a little bit and that's okay. So what is your inspiration for your patterns? It sounds like you've got, like, I'm, I, I actually should say this. Right behind Lewis is this collection of thread. I'm looking at him on Skype, and he's got this massive collection of thread and fabric. So I know that he definitely has the stuff to do this with. And I've seen some of his beautiful quilts on Facebook. So tell me about your inspiration for making quilts and your, your own designs. Well, sometimes uh, in the uh, morning, like 3 a.m., 2 a.m., when I'm on my night shift, I usually, when there's no people around, I start Googling about quilts and I see videos, so I get inspiration in that. I see, oh, this, this pattern looks fine, but I would add this thing, I would do it this size, I would change that thing, 
and sometimes I come up with new patterns and that's what I usually I'm drawing I'm sketching on paper using my phone taking um, um, screenshots and so I keep all this coming together and when I have time I just put it and I get my inspiration right now I'm also working on a wallet a pattern which I designed from zero that's a new thing for me drawing on paper and adding all the seam allowance and having my colleagues to be the beta testers and I said okay you have this new wallet who wants it to try it and they also fight for it and it's it's nice to do so that's wonderful and that is a challenge you know learning how to write a pattern it's not an easy process and beta testing and stuff like that I mean you got to figure out all those like little nooks and crannies and make sure it's right so do you have plans to write and start like selling patterns or, or maybe books do you have any plans to do that um, not yet. Maybe what I'm planning to do is like starting to give classes. Uh, I have already been invited to, to some groups and so I explain one of the patterns and I go to their group. Um, they usually um, accept it very well and are so kind to me and invite me again and again and again. And people also ask that if I want to go and to start classes. but. With the time is hard, so I think I'll keep to attach to the YouTube videos and maybe probably the patterns I will try to make like a, a group or something where I can share them for now, because that's the point about it's it's just about sharing about getting in touch with the people. Absolutely, I completely agree. So, what is the hardest quilt project that you've tackled so far? Well, I think it was my first project. <laughs> Isn't it funny how that works out? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't have any idea about about um, quilting so I think I saw a pattern in Missouri Star Quilt Company that was summer in the park I saw Jenny's video and I have like three fabrics a kitten fabric an old fabric and a blue fabric and that was my first quilt I didn't even knew what was a quarter of inch seam allowance <laughs> I saw it with a regular <laughs> so my pieces wouldn't fit and that's the quilt that I'll show in a picture later and it came out pretty well it was a little um, the borders got a little wavy at the end then the quilt the quilter said to me like oh you didn't cut this right you have to cut it in, in the straight grain for straight of grain and I what are you talking about I have no idea <laughs> that's a totally different language lady <laughs> yeah and, and so I started finding out about what were they, they're talking about, what had, I had to do to improve that, and so I started making more body, more more quilts. I love making quilt babies, baby quilts. Uh, well, quilt babies, maybe. I like quilt babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they love them too. They love their quilts. <laughs> so uh, you are, yeah, I've seen on Facebook that you've posted several pink, really pink floral very girly baby quilts and Josh was like you got to check this out this is so cool and Josh was actually the one was like hey you know do you, have you have you seen Lewis's quilt that he posted today and I was like oh that's so pretty so um who are you making these for because you've made several of them yeah sometimes I don't have anyone in mind I just uh start making it and I say okay what can I quilt here what can I do uh what colors look good and then as I'm advancing in the quilt, a baby appears somewhere, is having a baby, and someone asks me for a baby quilt, and I say, okay, I have just the right one for you. And other times I just, uh, when I design a quilt or when I'm building a quilt for someone, I just ask, okay, what are your favorite colors? What do you want? What do you like? What is the baby room like? Um, what is your favorite animal? And so I, I try to design the things by learning what the person is like and what they like about. And so I design it and I use the colors that are according to their, their choice. And also when I'm quilting them, because uh, when I started free motion quilting, as I said, it was a mess and I don't get high quality threads here. So I learned to quilt with regular thread and I learned that every combination of backing, batting, and top is different. And even the thread adds another variable. And every time you have to try, you have to test on a scrap piece of the quilt. 
uh, so you get your tension right and you solve all your issues. So I started quilting and I, I sometimes I don't know what to quilt. I just start making wavy motion and like stippling. And then I think the quilt asks what she wants. Uh, you start seeing like, for example, that pink one we were talking about, it has like pinwheels around. And I started, okay, these look like flowers. Let's quilt some petals around here. And then I said, okay, these look fine, but I would like some butterflies and they are around the flowers and I'm putting some vines and some leaves and suddenly it was quilted, like quilted to death, but it would turn out pretty nice. It, it was a very intense work, but it was a nice one. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, there's another one of the pink ones where I made like a little sampler and uh, this was for a high school classmate that had her baby. Uh, her baby was in the intensive care unit for about 15 days. So I had made the quilt in advance for her and when she said that she wasn't taking the baby out, so I was like, okay, I want this baby to be nice, to be good. Uh, to get out fast and as I was quilting it I, I also think that you can put your feelings in the quilt and I was quilting it with love and, and wishing all those good stuff to her and so it came out all the flow all the stippling all the swirls uh, everything I put in that in that quilt was with a thought in mind and so that's what I give to her as a gift and she took it right away to the baby and they were out like in three days and oh. I was so happy for her and I also love when they send me pictures of the babies with their quilts. Mm -hmm. I even uh, asked for one of them to send me a picture and she said, oh sorry, it has a chocolate stand. But I think that's the point. Babies gotta use their quilts. <laughs> I don't see a point in a baby using a quilt just to be in the wall or in a, in a cradle. They have to use it. I saw one of uh, Mary Fons' videos uh, where she was talking to Marianne Fons and they were talking about baby quilts and they said that if they reach um, their school or their kindergarten with their quilt torn apart and raggedy, so it was a nice quilt. It was a good quilt for them. Exactly. And I love that. You're quilting with, you know, putting all of those things that you want that that mother and that child to have and quilting with emotion. And that is like, that is always my goal to make a quilt mean more, you know, and it's not just putting fabrics together and, and stitching the layers together, but it's you're giving somebody a hug, you know, you're giving somebody your love and wrapping them up in that. I really think that that's why quilting is so amazing. Uh, and it's so unique in that way. Like I used to do beadwork and make necklaces, but you can't hug somebody with a necklace, <laughs> you know, yes. it wasn't the same way. So that is incredible. Um, so when you're sharing a video and like kind of coming up with a tutorial and everybody, please go check out Luis's tutorials. They're in Spanish, but the translator works really, really well. And I think that your tutorials are just amazing and how you break it down and all of the steps and your videography is excellent. Like I wish my first videos looked that good. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how you make videos and how you plan it out. And um, sorry, just for a nerdy question, what camera are you using? Cause your shots are great. <laughs> well, I am actually using my, my phone. I have a Galaxy, Galaxy 8. Um, and uh, that's the phone I use uh, with the camera. I started buying a PC and a video card and all stuff, and I didn't use it. I just started with a free app that was called like Video Show or something, and then I upgraded to the Pro version. And I do all my editing in my phone. I record everything on my phone. The only thing I had trouble at first was with the audio. So I bought a lavalier microphone and then uh, um, like bunny or tail microphone. And that's what I use right now. I film in my studio and I usually uh, get my ideas from uh, what people ask me to do. They usually, hey, why don't you do a tutorial on this? Why don't you do a tutorial on that? Um, I would like to see how to make this kind of things. And that's where I get, I, I have a, a notebook where I write all my ideas and so far I'm behind of them because there are lots of tutorials to make and so few time that uh, but I promise I'll keep them. I try to post a weekly videos. Sometimes I can do two videos um, on a weekend uh, but it's uh, long work because
videos, you have to edit it, and you have to learn when you make your cuts uh, what you said last and what you're going to say after uh, to make it less editable. So you don't have to cut a lot and they, the video won't look chopped. So that's the hardest part. And sometimes I make things in advance. For example, I start a project, I have another one like halfway and the finished one. So I start like switching and usually it doesn't take me more than an hour to film a video. Uh, usually about an hour more to edit it. I have a rotative schedule in my work. So whenever I'm in the afternoon, it's my most productive uh, month because I film in the morning, I have great light and I am more awake. I usually like it um, better because I have time to edit the video and then I give it uh, to upload. I usually upload it to Facebook and to YouTube and it's better because sometimes even in the afternoon when I'm at work, I get like a hundred notifications that people are watching already the video and say, okay, that's nice, I like it. And what people tell about is that I usually explain like simple. And that's what I try because usually if you use too much fancy words and sometimes you make too much cuts and you assume people know everything is not the best way. Because sometimes people need to be like taken by the hand and go slow to learn. And even old ladies, um, approach you know, messages and they say that they they are learning from my videos that I explain with patience and that's what they like and that's what I tried to do because it was hard for me to learn so I want people to learn as fast as I did I've been quilting just for about a year and a half and I think I've learned a lot I don't consider myself a pro I'm still learning I think we all do we never stop learning about new materials, about um, new things, about new techniques, and that's what keeps us going, what, what keeps us excited about doing this all the time. And people also come with new challenge every time, and that's what makes us go. Absolutely. I completely agree. And I love that you're, you know, making new videos based on what your audience is asking for. And I think that's terrific. I do that occasionally, but a lot of times, you know, I kind of have like a system or an idea kind of already in my head. And, you know, it's very interesting. I find sometimes when I ask for help and say, hey, guys, what do you think? Oftentimes, that's a more popular video than what I've come up with myself. So I think that's great. So this is the question I always ask everyone right at the end, and that is, what are you most looking forward to? You've just gotten started. You've been quilting a year and a half. So in the next five years, where do you want to go? And what do you want to do with this? Well, I want to quilt a lot. I want to make people learn to quilt. And I want to share with everyone what I've learned. That's my goals. I, I, I see myself like uh, not quitting medicine because that's my first passion and working at the hospital is the best thing I, I do in my life and I really, really love to be with people in there. But um, I, I want to like start uh, teaching people in person and also maybe your idea about um, putting some patterns uh, for sale maybe so I can get a little revenue from that and keep on going with this. I usually have lots of projects and I'm trying to make this year. By the end of the year, I will try to make a quilt for people to follow uh, with me to making a quilt along. And maybe the quilts we do, we can donate them to the children's hospital or something like that. That's what I have in mind for the last of, um, period of this year. And in five years, I see me also working uh, uh, as a doctor, but I can see more videos in YouTube. I can see more people on Facebook. I have um, with more friends like all of you that share your love and share your passion. And that's, that's what I see. I, I think we all live in a small world right now that we are all connected and language is no longer a barrier for many people and uh, we have translators even in skype and we can get in touch we can share we can become um, a big quilter world and we can sew together and we can learn from each other and also what i've seen is that quilters have a great heart 
I've seen that every quilter has a great heart. And that's something that moves me. That's something that I really appreciate in this art. That they all are caring. They are, are givers. They all care about not what they sell, not what they can uh, profit from their quiltings. They usually do it for love. They usually do it for someone special, for, for what they like. I mean, there's also the, the business part, but um, it's, it's it, everything connected. I mean, you, you can't do a good job if you don't put your heart in it. Absolutely. I completely agree. And I wish you the best of luck, Luis, with all of this. And I can't wait to see more of your videos online. And I can't wait to see you on my YouTube channel and on Facebook, too. I feel like this is such a wonderful quilting friend that I have made. And I, you know, I'd love to maybe do a project with you. Maybe we could do something. You shoot a video and I shoot a video. What do you think? Well, that would be nice. I'd love to. Uh, and I look forward for it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you a lot. And thank you to all of you for being here with Leah. She's a great teacher. So that's it for this episode. If you'd like to find more episodes of the Hello My Quilting Friends podcast, check it out at leahday.com slash podcast. We have a player that will play through all of the episodes shared so far so you can binge listen for hours on end. Until next time, let's go quilt.